thank you for watching Career View Mirror. I'm your host, Joelle Crawford, and today we have with us Dr. Glenna Crooks, who is the founder of Cogent Sage Group, LLC, and the author of The Network Sage. And I am so pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I think talking is going to be a lot of fun today. Yes. Yes, welcome to my living room on stage. <laughs> it's actually very comfortable. I know, yeah. I, wish, I wish my living room looked this nice, but it, it's getting there. But I really appreciate you being here because I wanted to know more about what you do. What exactly do you do, Glenna? You know, I'm in my eighth career. Mm. Um, so I've got quite a rear view mirror to look in. And I would say that throughout all my career, mm -hmm. whether I was in education or in healthcare, whether it was the public sector in government, in, in a Fortune 50 company, mm -hmm. um, in smaller companies, in professional associations, I've done really only one thing. I organize chaos. Wow. And I solve complicated problems. Mm -hmm. I have a very weird mind. So I never met a problem or a puzzle I didn't like. Mm -hmm. And it's not um, uh, unusual that people call me up and say, we've got a problem when we've heard of you, we need your help. So I never know what's going to show up. But what I do have confidence in is that when I um, talk with people mm -hmm. and sit with them for a while with an open mind, mm -hmm. the answer appears. It just pops up. It's it just materializes. Uh, it's almost magic. Wow. Where did that come from? Where did this whole organizing chaos piece come from as you look in your career view mirror? You know, I don't know, <laughs> um, except that it started very early. Mm -hmm. I'm a boomer, and um, as a boomer, you can imagine there were a lot of kids in my neighborhood. There were 50 kids on my block. Whoa. And I don't know why the statistics, but only three of us were girls. Really? It should have been a different distribution, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I hung out with the boys, and I was something of a leader, apparently. At the age of five, um, we all got together, and we had a circus. A circus. We did a circus <laughs> with acts and costumes and some people had dogs and we taught the dogs tricks and we had this in my backyard. That's so fabulous. Except I never told my mother. Oh no. Until the day of when people showed up and she started <laughs> seeing our backyard filled with chairs and parents and kids with costumes. It's a credit to her patience that I'm still here to tell the tale. <laughs> Did you charge for the circus? Yeah, no, we didn't charge, it was free. but okay. we did offer treats, so I'm not sure who funded that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fabulous. Mm -hmm. So from, from the very beginnings of you being, you know, getting your start, you've been a ringleader. Uh, that's that's true. <laughs> that's fantastic. So so when you you've had this is your eighth career, right? Can you tell me a little bit more about how you've gotten to this place? Sure. Um, in the era that I grew up, uh, girls really had only two choices for a career if they were going to have one. Mm -hmm. Either you were a teacher or a nurse. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I knew from the start in first grade when I looked at teachers that that did not look like fun. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't going to do that. And um, nursing didn't sound like fun to me either. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I really floundered with a career choice until I was in college. And as it turns out, a, uh, an uncle was a principal and he had a fishing buddy who was a school psychologist. Huh. So it was okay for me to become a school psychologist. That's what I did. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now that required a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in educational psychology. Mm -hmm. And that's the work I did for three years. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it burned me out. Oh, I'm sure. So I did the only thing I knew how to do. I went back to school and got a doctorate. And I was so concerned about children when I saw them in schools. By the time I saw them and they were five, I felt like it was too late. Hmm. So I wanted to influence the life of a child earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, the first system that does that is healthcare. Right. So Absolutely. I studied healthcare and public health and the laws and regulations that determined the healthcare for children and moved into healthcare and I've really never looked back wow. because it's been so fascinating and so rewarding. Mm. And then so so when you were in public health care, what did you what did you do? Like what were your roles? The first of my roles, I worked in a an organization that monitored the quality of medical care for Medicare and Medicaid patients. Got it. 
mm -hmm. and made sure that if they were hospitalized, they needed to be, or that they were not discharged too soon. Right. Some things like that. Right. Um, it was during that time then that um, um, I met people from the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm who invited me to come inside and to be the senior health policy advisor in the administration. Wow. This is an interesting career juncture for me. Right. I almost turned it down. I just didn't Why? feel qualified. Oh, oh okay. So the imposter syndrome kind of kicked in. Now, then the lucky thing is mm -hmm. I knew the research. I knew mm -hmm. the literature that said if you give a job description to a man and to a woman, a woman will always say it takes more education and more experience. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? I might have to work hard, but that's okay. I want to work hard to work up. Oh, there we go. And that was the right decision. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful boss. I had fantastic staff. I had access to so many talented people from mm -hmm. not just around the country, but from around the world. It was like having a hundred mentors and all of them smarter than me, which is kind of territory I prefer. Mm -hmm, I like mm -hmm. being around smarter people. Absolutely. So you can learn from them. Uh, it was the best postdoc anybody ever did. Mm. And then that led me um, on stage a lot. Um, Ashley was one of the few women early on who was comfortable being a speaker on stage. That put me on other platforms. Absolutely. And so uh, someone from Merck heard me give a speech and recruited me to Merck to come and start their public policy operations. That moved me from Washington uh, further up the seaboard yes. here and then to New Jersey mm -hmm. where I loved living for a mm -hmm. number of years. Um, and then Merck offered me the opportunity to work in the vaccine business and that's when I became the global VP of the vaccine business. Wow. Yeah, I had offices on five continents. Wow. I went to each one once a quarter I thought nothing of 24 hours on an airplane. That, that didn't bother you? No, it was quiet time actually. The phone couldn't ring. That's <laughs> so, And nobody could get to me on email. Um, and the last thing that I did that I'm really very proud of is that I, I was in South Africa for three weeks and reopened our company the year that Mr. Mandela became president. <sighs> Wow, we had pulled out amazing. under apartheid. Mm. So I spent time there and then when the government found out I was there and had worked for Reagan, uh, they, the members of the government at the time had respect for Reagan. Mm. So mm -hmm. asked me to stay and help them figure out how to set up their public health system. So, how long did that take? I was really only there for three weeks. Oh I was gosh. an advisor. I had my own work to do, but then I had time spent with Mr. Mandela's cabinet. Did you get to meet Nelson Mandela? No, Don't not know. him. Uh, you know, but I met his ministers of finance Close. and economics mm -hmm. and health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is so awesome. It was a tremendous uh, privilege to, to be there. Yeah. You know, the hope in that country was palpable. Um, that man held the country together in a mm -hmm. way that um, only a deeply genuine uh, leader could do. Mm. Yeah. That was like you were part of history. Uh, Do you feel that way? A small part, a small part, that's all. I feel like I was a privileged observer mm. of history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. That's so fascinating. That is so fascinating. So now you're in this new venture. Right. And so what does that mean? Like, what are you, what are you doing now? How are you, you wrangling the cats and making order out of chaos? Out of chaos? Well, here's what happened. Um, once I left Merck, I created my own consulting firm. Mm -hmm. My clients are businesses and governments around the world. Mm -hmm. They are people who are leaders, including presidents of the United States, I mean, cardinals in the Catholic Church, um, you know, people who were really carrying an extraordinary leadership ro role mm -hmm. uh, in, in their world. And I became a confidential advisor to them, not only helping them to solve whatever the problem was, mm -hmm. But you know how it is, you work a long day with someone, you have a long dinner. Yes. They have a second glass of wine, they let their hair down. Yes. Well, they started to confide in me that life was too complicated and they couldn't do it anymore. They wanted to quit. In some cases it was a job, in other cases it was a marriage, in some cases it was both. Whoa. And all I could think of was, what a shame, what a waste. You're educated, you're talented, mm -hmm. you're resourced. Some of these people had millions of dollars at their disposal. We've got all hands on deck, uh, you know, problems in this world. Right. We need all hands on deck. Yes. So I went looking for a solution to that chaos that they were feeling. I found one in a very unlikely place from a very unlikely person. <laughs> By that time, it was around 2005. 
five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. And 2007 is when the trailer for the first Iron Man came out. Oh, I love that film. I do love too. Love the whole series. I love, I love action flicks. Mm -hmm. Well, because of that, I noticed an interview with Robert Downey Jr. in a fashion magazine. In the interview, he said he had a pit crew of people helping him out a yoga teacher, a sensei, a psychiatrist, but he said, I need a pit crew because after all, I'm not a Model T, I'm a Ferrari. Oh, well. And I thought to myself, it must have been in a snarky mood that day. <laughs> Buster, if you're a Ferrari, I'm at least a Maserati. <laughs> there we go, Glenna, there we go. And you know what, you're right. It does take a pit crew, who's mine? Who's your pit crew? And how are they doing? And then after a while, I thought, uh-oh, I'm on other people's pit crews. Yes. How am I doing? How are you doing with them? Mm -hmm. Right. So that led me into studying my own life. Now, without realizing it, I had looked at pit crews for my business. I'd had a consultant who said, why don't you make a list of everybody you have to manage to have this business? Mm -hmm. So I knew that, mm -hmm. but I had no idea about my personal life. So I put a blank sheet of paper on the kitchen counter, and as people's names came, I wrote them down, or maybe a bill would arrive, and mm -hmm. that would remind me. Um, when I stopped, I had 139 people on this list. What? My first thought was, am I high maintenance or what? <laughs> That's a lot of people. And then I realized that compared to most people, I have a simple life, because I don't have a spouse, mm -hmm. so there's no in-laws or his colleagues and friends on yeah. my list. I don't have children, so no teachers or coaches or soccer moms and mm -hmm. orthodontist. <laughs> My elderly mom was healthy. She didn't need me for anything but fun and love. Well, there you go. I didn't have a dog. I didn't have a cat. So I started finding ways to make my life better and easier. My income started to double year on year. My health got better. I was uh, more available to my friends for socializing. And people noticed. So when I told them what I did, they tried it. And um, they had similar positive outcomes. So then I knew this just wasn't about me. It wasn't just a one-off. There were some universal principles here mm -hmm. that everybody could use, which I've now shown in my research with people ranging in age from 7 to 87. Wow. Although my 87-year-old is now 91. God bless them. And still in living independently. <laughs> wow. Because of their understanding and building the networks of support that they needed to do that. That is fabulous. That is fabulous. I know that we're probably going to have to take a break before we dig a little deeper into this, but I've got to know. I mean, I saw, I've been reading your book, and I've got to show people what that org chart looks like okay. of your list. Sure. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper. We're going to take a short break and um, we're going to be able to dig a little deeper into the book, The Network Sage, so that we can share some of those nuggets of knowledge with other people. But you got to buy the book. you got to buy the book to get all of the nuggets of knowledge. So we'll be taking a short break and we'll be back in a few. Choosing Medicare coverage can be a very confusing and complicated process. Help is just a phone call away, 856-226-4800. As a licensed insurance agent, I'll assist you in making an informed and confident decision on a Medicare plan that meets your needs, lifestyle, and budget. Call me today for a free, no obligation, Medicare benefits consultation, 856-226-4800. 4,800. Boardwalks built for fun. Legendary rock and roll clubs. This is how we do it. Hip and pop. Casinos by the ocean. Hip and pop. Now that's New Jersey. 130 miles of beautiful beaches. Solid rock and everything in between. Look in the window. <laughs> now that's New Jersey. Burlington County College. Is now Rowan College at Burlington County. Still the same great faculty. At a community college ranked top 50 in the nation. Basically, we earn more and pay less. RCBC students are accepted at Rowan University after graduation. And get a bachelor's degree for around $30,000. Online and Mount Laurel students get a 15% Rowan University tuition discount. And have many scholarship opportunities. So you earn more and pay even less. 
Rowan College of Burlington County. Your path to success. They are the greatest fighting force the world has ever seen. But what does it take to strengthen our service members? What does it take to let them know that we stand behind them, wherever they are? What does it take to bridge the distance and keep them connected to family, home, and country? And what does it take to prepare them for their future when their service to the nation is complete? What does it take to strengthen our service members so they can be the greatest force for good in the world? It takes a force. Be a force behind the forces. Share a message today at force.uso.org. Hi, and welcome back to the Career View Mirror. And I've got Dr. Glenna Crooks with me. And she is not only the co founder of Cogent Sage Group LLC, but she is the author of The Network Sage. Can you see the book? It's right there, it is. It's fabulous, and I've been, as you can see, I've been reading all kinds of things, and we were looking at, we were talking before break about your pit crew, and it's amazing how intricate it is. Um, and you were telling me, how long does it take to make your pit crew or come up with your network? If you were to take the time that I spent, um, it was probably a grand total of eight hours, not in one sitting. I was like, no, 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 not in one sitting. Um, you know, I would sit down sometimes on the patio on a Sunday afternoon mm. and, you know, think about people or, like I said, I would remember somebody when a bill came. Uh, I've always known, though, that this was a process that would be too long for people to really engage in without assistance. Mm. So there are two forms of assistance. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, three. The first form is the book. Mm -hmm. In the book, I lay out the networks, which I hope we have a chance to talk about, yes. and the types of people in them. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, is that I have developed an app. It's not. It's designed. It's not coded yet. Ooh. So I'm currently in the process of looking for investors mm -hmm. to help complete the coding and launch this. Once that's available, mm -hmm. it'll take about 15 minutes for somebody to identify all of the types of people in their networks and then do some of the things that I suggest they do in order to optimize the support that they have. That's fabulous. In the meantime, I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good, and mm -hmm. I coach. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. any a, a variety of types of coaching for people, if it's a deep dive right now because they've got a crisis mm -hmm. to deal with, or an opportunity that's mm -hmm. presenting itself, or somebody who would like to take a little bit more measured time and really lay things out for themselves, their family, or maybe their business, mm -hmm. that would take a few more sessions. So right. that, would be, that would be the three ways. Wow, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So leaning little, a little bit more on the book, you talk about the various networks, the importance of networks. So can you tell me about the different networks that are involved? Exactly. And I will say that this came from my organizing a grand total of 7,000 types of people oh my gosh. that could support us as working adults. 7,000? 7, 7,000. I've identified 7,000. Wow. Okay? Now, um, 7,000 is a, a list that's hard to deal with, <laughs> so let's chunk it out into mm -hmm. networks, okay? So all together, you as a working person mm -hmm. are in eight networks. Okay. Wow. Okay. But yeah. Now the first five mm -hmm. I call birthright networks. That's because your parents created them for you. Mm -hmm. If you're a parent, you create these for your children. Mm -hmm. This is very intuitive once you hear it. First of all, a family network. Okay. Right? Makes sense. That makes sense. I've got so that. So there's your family of origin, the one mm -hmm. you were born into. There's your family t now, mm -hmm. if you're married or partnered in some mm -hmm. way. There's former family, if you or your current spouse or life partner were married before. Right. And then there's just like family. Ah. People who aren't related by blood or marriage. Mm -hmm. But you consider them family, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay. The second network is your health and vitality network. So health, people who are the physicians, the pharmacists, the dentists, the optometrists, those people who help you with your physical health, uh -huh. or people in an institution like a hospital, oh, okay. if you have to go there. Mm -hmm. Then in this group, I place people who help you be fit, 
And finally, people who help you look good. Oh. Because one of the things we know is attractive people make a quarter of a million dollars more over the course of their lifetime. Wow. Attractive children get better grades and they get breaks from their teachers. That's very true. So that's the second that's network. True. The third is education and enrichment. So education is everything that you did to get to the career you have now. Okay. Elementary school, high school, college, maybe graduate school, maybe mm -hmm. professional school. Mm -hmm. Okay. That got you in the door. Mm -hmm. And then enrichment. The arts, museums, plays, things, reading, things of mm -hmm. book clubs, things of that sort okay. that you do for enrichment. It's kind of making sense so far, yes, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Next is a spiritual network. And there are two components mm -hmm. there. One component are those people who are associated with a religious congregation. Okay. So the clergy, the choir, the members, you know, people who teach religious education right. within that formal setting. Mm -hmm. And then you may have some other forms of spirituality right. outside of that congregation. Outside of that. Mm -hmm. Some people that's yoga. For some people that's hiking groups in the woods. For some people that's volunteering and rocking babies in the hospital. Right. Right? Right. Okay? Then there's a social and community network. That's the fifth. Mm -hmm. The fifth birthright network. So starting out as a child, your neighborhood, yes. the building you live in, mm -hmm. and then as you grow up and you move wider in the world, especially when you can drive or take mass transit, mm -hmm. the bigger community. Absolutely. And for a lot of people now, it's the entire world. They it's see themselves big. as a member of the world community. Now those are five birthright networks. Parents create them at the start. Mm -hmm. You start adapting them as you grow up. You will never outgrow the need for what those networks provide for you. Those are critical. They're those are the foundational your networks. Higher life. Then you mature into three more that I call coming of age networks. Oh. So the first one's a career network. Okay. Okay. So that's where we usually think about networking. Mm -hmm. That's where I've got you know, my tabby. Yes. You know, <laughs> you know, the people in your organization, maybe mm -hmm. above you, below you, the lateral to mm -hmm. you. Maybe you have a role for your company that's outside, mm -hmm. dealing with customers or regulators or the press or whatever mm -hmm. there. And then your own career education. Ah. The things you do to keep a license or certified. Absolutely. Uh, to grow in your portfolio of things that you can offer within your career. That's, for me, the career network. Then you have a network called home and personal affairs. Household. Oh. What kind of place do you live in? Is it a single family home? In which case you've got responsibility for the inside and the outside. Mm -hmm. It is a rental apartment, in which case you don't have as much responsibility mm -hmm. for caring for it. And then your personal affairs <clears throat> are people like your banker, your lawyer, your car dealer, a jeweler maybe. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. They help you protect and grow your assets. That's great. Finally, you have a network I call ghosts. 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 I did not go looking for ghosts, <laughs> but they started showing up. So there's a couple of kinds. So ghosts are people, for the most part, who used to be in your life who are no longer. Ah. Maybe they passed away, yes. they moved away, your paths diverged. I mean, think about it. Your best friend in third grade? Right. Are you still in touch? Probably not. I actually kind of am. <laughs> Whoa, are you? <laughs> I'm the sock that doesn't get lost in the laundry, okay. Glenn. <laughs> so I, I can, do have friends that are that. <laughs> I can understand that about yeah. you. Um, <laughs> and um, so, um, you know, so, but think about the people you're not in connection with, mm -hmm. contact anymore. Yes, yes. And there are two kinds of mm -hmm. these, and I think I like to talk about these because they're important. Mm -hmm. Some I call friendly ghosts. Mm. They loved you and you knew it. Yeah. You know, for me, that was my grandfather. Ah, uh, you know, yes. He died when I was five, and I don't remember what he looks like, except in family photos, mm -hmm. but I do remember how wonderful it was to sit in his lap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you have hungry ghosts. I call them hungry because you know, you couldn't satisfy them then and you can't satisfy them now, <laughs> but you are still trying, not with them, because they're not here, but with people or in situations who remind you of them. Yes. And boy, can that ruin your life. Absolutely. For a moment, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then there's one other type that has recently emerged, and that I'm calling role models. And this happened because I was working with one woman who said, you know, I want to put Oprah on my map. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. I'll never meet her, but I really admire her. Mm -hmm. And there's the things about her I aspire to mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? It's your map. You can do what you want Absolutely. with it. Absolutely. So, um, and, and there's really value there. And here's why. This is something from network science. Every network that you are in has a center of gravity. 
If you are below that center of gravity, it will pull you up. Mm. If you are above that center of gravity, it will pull, pull you, you down. down. Mm -hmm. I learned this playing tennis, <laughs> although I didn't realize it at the time. When I played tennis with a better player, my game was better. Right. So what this woman was saying, in a sense, in a sense was, I want to raise the center of gravity in this network. And mm -hmm. that's a, I think, a very powerful mental model it is. for getting ahead. It is. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they say all the time, you know, dress for the role that you, mm -hmm. you see yourself in or, you know, people have vision boards. And I think that this is that kind of thing to just kind of get you pulled up to that, yeah. that level. Exactly. She's, Oprah's in my network, too. She's going she's gonna to be Good. in there. <laughs> Good. But no, but that's fascinating about the ghosts, you know, and mm -hmm. certain ghosts that we battle some, and some ghosts that we just kind of allow into our lives. And uh, You know, and, and I, like, I know when their mind are going to show up. Mm -hmm. When I'm writing, they come out and they pitch a tent in my office oh. and they scream at me. You know, who cares what you have to say? Right. And now they're going to, you're putting this in print? Right. Now they're going to know you're stupid. You know, <laughs> so, you know. I think they come to visit me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, I just sit them down some days and I say, I know you were going to show up. Let's have a cup of tea and talk it out. Oh, you know? that's very yeah. good. That's a good way to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Instead of calling Ghostbusters to right. come and get them out of the house, you just right. deal with it. You work right. with it, work right. through it. So yeah, that's definitely helpful. Mm -hmm. And I, and you know, I, I often wonder about you know, with networks and networking and keeping those those all those networks together. How do you? How, I mean, a lot of a lot of the people that watch the show are very timid about networking, right? Uh -huh. Working their networks, um, and they mm -hmm. feel like it's just it feels squishy for them. It feels unnatural. You know, what can you what can you share about the importance of networks? Why is it so important for us to have these and cultivate them? Robert Downey Jr. was on to something mm -hmm. when he said he needed a pit crew. Mm -hmm. We all do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to come at this from a philosophical perspective. I see every person mm -hmm. as being in the center of this whole mm -hmm. configuration mm -hmm. of networks. Mm -hmm. And I see every person as absolutely the most valuable and important person on the planet. You are the product of 500 generations of ancestors mm. who've lived before you, mm -hmm. as is everybody else on the planet today. Yes. You know family stories. You know enough of human history to know what your ancestors went through, what they suffered through, died for, hoped for, loved about. You're here today because of that. It seems to me that means you have not only a right, you have a responsibility to live this life well and to reach out to those people who are in your pit crews to get the help to do it. If you do it, if you really succeed, you will have honored them mm. and all of what it took for them to get you here. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, you will bless everyone who comes after you, whether you're, they're part of your own family lineage or not. You will have a ripple effect that can literally impact millions and millions of people in the future. So with that's where I would encourage people to meditate for a while. Right. Look at me and this amazing opportunity I've been given. How is it that I optimize this? Uh, in part by reaching out and finding the right people within my networks and engaging with them, making sure that they know what I need from them. Mm -hmm. And in part so that I can turn around and do a good job being in other people's networks. Absolutely. Be the other person's right. networks, the strong network member. Right. You're in, <sighs> so you have people that are in your pit crew, mm -hmm. but you are in entirely different people's pit crews right. that may not know these people over here. Right. And in order to serve them, you need I support. Serve for them. Yeah. Oh. This is so fabulous, and of course we've run out of time because I want to know more. So we're going to have to have you back on so ah, we anytime. can dive in more deeply anytime. about this. So rich, so wonderful. I mean, that just gave me the chills about uh, my role for my, my ancestors. So thank you so, so very much for being on the show. Do not forget to get her <laughs> fabulous book. As you can see, I am already working my way through it. The Network Sage. Dr. Glenna Cooks, thank you so much for you being on the show. You are very welcome. Thank you.
And don't forget to watch us on Mondays at 1.30 at Career Vermeer on RVN TV. Take care.